it's not an environmental thing that was pushed on me or some food I ate that suddenly I broke out with transgender. It took me a long time to get to this point when I'm comfortable living my own skin. And I'm very comfortable living the way I'm living right now because it's, it's natural to me now. And I've never had that. All right, that was Kristen Beck, who retired from the military in 2011 after decades of service as a Navy SEAL. He's profiled if in multiple CNN features nearly a decade ago, which chronicled her transition as a transgender female. But now the former Navy SEAL is detransitioning back to a male. And in a recent interview said that the words that he spoke on CNN and the inner peace he portrayed in those interviews were all lies. Everything you see on CNN with my face, do not even believe a word of it. I destroyed my life. I'm not a victim. I did it to myself. But I had some help. <laughs> Darn it. All right, joining us right now is clinical psychologist Dr. Erica Anderson. Dr. Anderson, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks. You know, I know that you met Chris Beck 10 years ago, shortly after he transitioned. Uh, I think you know better than most what he's endured. You transitioned and then uh, by, by him transitioning and then detransitioning. Give us some insight as to what he has gone through and, and I guess maybe just in general the medical consequences that he might be dealing with. Well, I've never been his treating psychologist, so I'm uh, telling you what I think I know in general. Right. And I did, and I did meet Chris Beck uh, shortly after he transitioned uh, and was uh, retired from, from the Navy. Um, it's well established that many trans people experience trauma of various types. And so there is that. Um, and in addition, uh, unfortunately for Chris, Chris probably has complex PTSD from his 20 years of uh, meritorious service in the Navy as a SEAL. So he's kind of got a double whammy of uh, the trauma he experienced as, as an active duty military person, probably in some pretty tight, dangerous situations over the years, and then quickly transitioned to being a civilian and um, came to terms with some turmoil he was experiencing. I'm worried that Chris, like many other trans people, haven't had sufficient mental health support to help them through this very difficult process of coming to terms with what's going on with them. And my heart goes out to him. I thank Chris for his service to the United States, and I hope that he gets all the help that he needs, he and his wife. Yeah, as, as a transgender woman yourself, and as someone who's experienced how mentally and emotionally taxing this entire process can be, uh, even for adults, I, I want to kind of hone in on the, this whole issue that's come up about kids and transgender issues. Are you concerned at all about the age at which we're discussing this or, and, and I, I apologize if I use this, but, but pushing the issue on kids? Because I think in some cases I saw the American Girl book come out the other day, and the question is, are we taking issues that children might not be ready to mentally understand and forcing them on them to think about at an age that they might not just be ready to comprehend? It, it's a good question. It's a complicated question. As you must know uh, from your research and your staff's research, I've been an outspoken uh, advocate for trans people for a long time, especially gender questioning and gender variant kids. But I have publicly stated and written and, and been interviewed about this and said that I'm worried that it's gone too far, that in our zeal to support people with sexual and gender minority identities, that we may have uh, overcorrected. And, uh, and so it's, it's a big issue now. It's kind of square in the, in the gun, gunshot of, uh, of the culture wars. And uh, we need more light. We need less heat. We need to be careful, I think. I'm interested in what's best for every child. And for some of them, it, it may mean a gender transition. And so, you know, I'm, I'm eager to have a, a role in the conversation. Okay, but as someone who is a mental health professional themselves, I guess the question is, a lot of times as a parent, my kids will come to me and say, you know, should I do this? Or, and, and 
they're, they're relying on others as they should to make decisions on their in, in their best interest. And they're questioning a lot of things at at those ages, at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And the question is, where is that line between a, a child or a, a preteen questioning things and them knowing the answer, right? So if we make a decision about transitioning them at 13 or 14 years old, when maybe they were just asking questions or they were going through a phase, where's that line, in your opinion? Well, it's difficult to draw that line, and it requires examination of the particulars in any individual case. Um, in the United Kingdom recently, and some health authorities in Europe, they've, they've uh, emphasized that we now have a larger group of young people coming forward to question their gender than ever before. With each succeeding younger generation, it's a larger and larger group. But the large group of gender questioning, as you imply, may not result in, in every case, a transgender child. A smaller group of gender questioning kids may ultimately prove to be transgender. I think we've conflated gender questioning and transgender uh, in uh, society, and I think it's unfortunate. We need to listen Doctor, to every child. Can I, yes. Can, I apologize, but I only have 30 seconds left. I just want to ask you a request because you brought that up, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you, you touched on something. Why do you yes. think it's becoming more and more? Why, why are more kids questioning their gender than ever before? This It didn't seem to be an issue when I was a kid. Why are they doing this at a greater rate? Well, LGBTQ acceptance has improved uh, in the last decades, and I'm, I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of greater acceptance of everyone in society. And so kids know, know that, that it's safer now um, than it might have been in another era to question these things. And kids are feeling free to question all kinds of things. That's the normal course of things, particularly for teenagers who are trying to explore their identity. So we have more kids questioning. But but do you think that there's a role? I mean, I think there's one thing between a kid questioning and 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 it being pushed on them. And I, I find that, to some degree, the media and and some of the left is sort of when when a kid might question and sort of them questioning, like a lot of kids question anything, uh, that they're being pushed towards an, a, a side as opposed to being able to question something. I I, I wonder how much the media uh, is, is responsible for some of this. Well, it's no question that young people consume social media uh, in, in huge volumes, greater than ever before. It's no question that there's influence from peers, and these factors are important. The pandemic that we are not yet uh, completed completely through has isolated many kids and forced them online, and unfortunately, they're learning a lot of things that aren't very helpful. Yeah. Dr. Anderson, I appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks for having me.